All right, everybody, we are live with another episode of the Red Delta Project Podcast, taking a fundamental approach to diet and exercise to help you give you more control and freedom in your healthy lifestyle. Matt Schifferly is always in the house here for you, as well as uh, not being just the founder of the Red Delta Project, we are also going to be exploring today the big advantages that come with building muscle and strength with age. Now, this is a little bit of a message that I think needs to be a little more in our fitness culture, largely because a lot of times you hear people say, oh, you know, once you get older, it's all downhill from there. And I've been hearing this stuff for years myself. I would be working out, building muscle and strength when I was a teenager, and people would say, oh, just wait until you're past 25, and then wait till you're past 30, and wait till you're past 35, wait till you're 40. And I'm like, yeah, guys, can you hurry it up here? You know, it's like, I'm tired of waiting. And by the way, every five years, when you think it's going to be going downhill, it just keeps going on an upward trajectory for me. And that's because yes, age does matter. Like I'm not going to be on this podcast saying, oh, age is just a number and all that kind of thing, uh, because it's not true. Age is an influence. It does matter, uh, but it matters in some ways negatively. If you don't take care of yourself, but it can also matter in a very positive light as well. It can make you have advantages for building muscle and strength as you get older. It's not always a downward slide. And to begin uh, with this little philosophical flip of the switch, I wanted to first explore the fact that many of the advantages that come with strength training are more important and have a bigger impact in your quality of life as you get older. This is something I realize now as I'm getting older, I've just turned 43 a couple of weeks ago. And so when I was younger, like, what's the big deal? Like I get bigger and I get some muscle and some strength and I'm like, what do I get to really get out of that? I'm going to be a faster bike racer. I'm going to kick harder in Taekwondo and I'm going to look a little bit better for the high school pool party or the college pool party or whatever. It's like, okay, great. Wonderful. That's all good. But now as I'm getting older, now the abilities to stay strong and build strength and improve my health and fitness have much bigger ripple effects throughout my life because it's helping me to stay lean. It's helping me to stay pain free. It's keeping me enjoying a lot of the activities that I enjoy like biking and skiing and all these other things that I like to do outside. Meanwhile, I do know a lot of people who are used to be friends. It's like, remember we used to go and we used to go mountain biking. We used to do this and we used to do that. And they're like, oh, now, man, yes, my, my hips and my knees and I can't do this and I don't have this strength. And it's like, oh, geez, man, it's like you're only like in your early 50s and you're not able to go skiing with me anymore. That kind of sucks because a lot of that does come from strength training. When we are strength training, we are literally reversing a lot of the detrimental effects that come with age, things like just sarcopenia, which is the loss of muscle mass. You lose that stuff potentially a lot faster as you get older, but strength training reverses it. They talk a lot about hormones and hormonal changes and stuff as you get older. Again, strength training is a big influence to reversing that sort of thing. So the point I'm trying to make is that as we get older, a lot of people will think, well, if you can't be in the best shape and you can't have shredded abs and you can't be like the 21 year old cover model who's the star of their sports team, what's the point? And the point is because there's a lot more to life than just that peak optimal level that you can theoretically only achieve in your 20s. But as you get older, your ability to live the life you want is more influenced by your health and your strength and even the amount of muscle in your body more and more every single decade. So this whole idea of you don't get as much benefit as you get older is bull. You get more benefit that directly impacts the quality of your everyday life. But it's not just the benefits that you have. It's also why are you getting more benefits from strength training? In some ways, I'm stronger and more fit now at the age of 43 than I was at 23. I even made a video on this last year, back when I was 42, when I was better and stronger at 42 than I was at 22. And a lot of that is because there are certain things that come with just time and age that you just don't have in your youth, especially for some individuals with certain body types. So let's explore some of these right off the bat. Number one, an advantage of building muscle and strength with age is just the simple process of time and gaining experience. So this is one of those things that may or may not matter more to some people. Like if you're starting strength training 
when you're 53, you're kind of in the same boat experience-wise as someone who's starting their training when they are 23. Okay, you're starting off either way. But as you get older, if you've got a decade of strength training under your belt or 20 years or even eight years under your belt or so, you now have one of the most vital resources in your training career, which is experience. And for all of the information that's out there, everything you can learn online and all the programs and the books you can buy and stuff, that stuff is great for getting started. But ultimately, the stuff that's going to take you beyond the initial beginner stages of building your strength and your health and fitness isn't going to come from some cookie cutter program or some YouTube video or the things that you are just getting piecemeal on the internet. That stuff is for beginners. It's for the first six months to two or three years of your training career. Ultimately, the stuff that's really going to be beneficial for you is the stuff you gain from experience. When you experience how certain exercises make you feel, when you experience how certain training programs affect you and influence you, when you experience how various dietary approaches influence your health, then you take that experience and you start building your own approaches. You start building your own methods that work best for you. You're not going to get the stuff that works best for you from cookie cutter programs. There's no way that some jack off on the internet like me knows what you really should be doing. No matter how much research I comb through, I don't know what works best for your lifestyle, what works best for your preferences, what works best for your body type. You know, I can guess and I can say, well, the research says so and so, but it's an estimated guess at best. But your experience of having years behind your belt and say, I just know this is the way I like to do things. This is what I respond to. That's going to pay off big time as opposed to just program hopping all over the place, hoping that someone's just going to get lucky and know what you should be doing. So age comes or experience it comes with age. So experience is one of the best things that you can have when you're getting older for any type of thing in life, but especially when it comes to building muscle and strength. The second thing too, is sometimes we look at the body's changes as we get older, kind of like the miles on the body and say, oh, you know, my knees, they got worn out. And my body got worn out. and I got worn out this, worn out that and stuff. But that's not always the case because our body is always growing and developing and changing. It's not like you turned 18 and everything stopped, right? You're always developing your body. And the body, it kind of, if you ever see those pictures of like a tree that grows around a fence post or it grows around something that someone had left, like a farming tools or something, uh, and they grow in relation to their environment, well, the body's very much the same kind of a thing where our conditioning that we subject ourselves to on a daily basis is still influencing your development and growth throughout your entire life. Like there's no point where our body stops developing. It never happens. They've taken people who in, the, in their senior years, 80s, 90s even, and brought them some strength training equipment and their body still adapts and changes to it. You never run out of that runway until, of course, the day you die. So the point I'm making is as we get older, our body is still developing and is still changing around these things. So we wear in these grooves on how we can perform well. This is why like in my world of the martial arts, you'll still see individuals who are in their 60s, 70s. I even know a guy is 80. And it's like, dear Lord, how are you that good at throwing sidekicks? How are you that capable, even though you're older? And it's like, guy's been doing it for <laughs> 30 years. Person's been doing it for so long that their body developed around those capabilities. So as we get older, we're still changing and developing and our age is growing around these things we're demanding of ourselves. The key of course, is you've got to keep doing those things. Like you can't take 10 years off of doing pull-ups then come back to it because you've already lost quite a bit of ground. There's still of course value to doing it, but you're not going to be able to regain all of those years that you lost. Another advantage too is sometimes for a lot of people, a metabolic advantage. And some pe people will say, oh, once you get older, your metabolism starts to slow down. That's not always a bad thing, especially if you're looking to build muscle. That's certainly been my case as well. When I was much younger, especially in my early 20s and stuff, it was impossible for me to build muscle because I've got the metabolism of an atom bomb. Like I just eat stuff and my body just processes it so fast. It was always hard for me to put on muscle. But as I've gotten older, I've gotten just a little tiny bit slower, which is a natural process of aging. And it's made it a hell of a lot easier 
to rebuild some of that muscle and actually put some of the calories I'm eating, not towards just a super high metabolism, but towards actually building myself up. And that's why in many ways, I've got some muscles in my body, especially in my back, that are bigger now at 43 than they've ever been throughout my entire life. Because I'm finally able to have that metabolic process slow down enough to get me to build muscle. And I should note too, that this isn't always just for guys in their 40s or their 50s and 60s. In many ways, this is also in their 20s and 30s. Like we don't all have these optimal windows of development at the same period in our life. Like some people, yeah, they're benching 315 in high school and they're built like, you know, the Hulk. But other guys, they're not going to be able to hit that window of when they can optimally build themselves into their late 30s. So don't be too discouraged. I get emails all the time from people saying, I've been strength training. I just can't seem to build muscle. It's so frustrating. It's like your window may be later on in life. And he says, yeah, when I was 17, I couldn't make my body change or develop to save my life because it wasn't my best time. Your best time may not be for another 20 years in some regards. So don't fall into these ideas that permeate our fitness culture that your best muscle building years are between like ages 18 and 25 or any of that stuff. I know plenty of people where they're like, yeah, I didn't really start to have abs until in my mid 30s. I didn't start to actually be able to do pull-ups with a lot of proficiency until I was over 45. There's no such thing as a set point for everybody where you have an optimal window and then all of a sudden it starts to tank. Your best time to build muscle and strength may be well after someone else has stated that it's best for you. The other thing too that comes with experience is that you now also have a little bit less leeway to train or eat in a dumb way. Now, this might seem like a disadvantage at first. You know, people are like, oh, I was younger. I used to party all night and then I'd go and win a soccer competition. Or I used to be able to work out like I was crazy and demonic and do all this great stuff and eat nothing but junk food and stay lean and ripped and shredded. That sounds great in hindsight, but it's actually not the best because when we're younger and we have basically kind of a, a longer leash, we can get away with more stupid stuff. We can get away with a worse diet. We can get away with abusive workout programs. We can get away with using really bad technique and we think we're perfectly fine. But as we get older, of course, the body can't handle quite as much. It's like you've got a narrower road that you can drive on. Now, for a lot of people, they just quit and they'll say, oh, I can't do what I used to do. There's no point, I'm on the downward slide. But the smart individuals will say, I can't be stupid in my programming or my diet anymore. I've got to actually learn to do this in a smart way. I've got to squat in a way that doesn't beat my knees up. I have to eat in a way that feeds my body rather than just putting calories in and just saying, here, handle whatever. And the body just kind of gets abused by overabundance of food and stuff. We don't have as much of a leeway when we get older. And that's a good thing because now you're forced to train smarter. You're forced to eat smarter. You're forced to actually do what is best in your best interest. You don't have as much of a buffer to do stupid stuff or do detrimental stuff. So basically when we think, oh, I'm losing ground and I can't be as carefree as I used to be, now life is actually forcing you to step up and be responsible about what you're doing. And you can now investigate and say, why do I feel like crap when I do this workout? Why do I not feel as good when I eat these kinds of foods? Why do I have a negative effect from this? And you can then take that and learn how to do things better. And then you'll probably like me come back and be like, oh, now I've changed, made these changes. I wish I knew this stuff 20 years ago because now it's so much easier to be strong and to build muscle and be healthy and not beat myself up. Whereas when I was younger, I could get away with that stuff. Now you have to be smarter. I'm always referring to this old quote from Bruce Lee who talked about when he was getting older. Of course, he only lived to be 32. But he's like, as I get older, I find myself warming up a little bit better and starting my workouts a little slower. I can't tell if that's because I'm getting older or if I'm getting smarter. And the fact of the matter is because you're getting older, you have to be smarter about it. And being smarter is always a step forward. It's not being uh, gentle with yourself and saying, well, I've got to handle my body with kid gloves and being more fragile and everything. It's because you actually have to step up and learn how to work with your body rather than against it. 
So those are some of the biggest advantages that at least I've noticed when it comes to building muscle and strength with getting older. And I, for one, embrace the aging process because the older I get, <laughs> the more legitimate my methods seem to be. I used to get called out all the time when I was in my 20s and early 30s and stuff. People were like, yeah, sure, you can build muscle and strength, but you're younger. Wait until you're older. Wait until you're older. It's You've got that body or you've got that ability because you're young, because you're young. I'm like, I'm better now at 43 than I was then. So now there's less of an excuse of, yes, I'm young, a young whippersnapper, I can do anything, it's because I'm young. But these days, we should be really looking at that type of attitude as not being true. I mean, there are kids who are obese these days. We've got kids in grade school who are suffering diseases and conditions that used to only afflict people supposedly when they were much older in life. But on the other flip side, we also have people who are in their 70s who are skiing double black diamonds out here in Colorado. We have people who are in AARP memberships and they're at the playground busting out pull-ups. Youth is not at all a shield against disease and poor conditioning, but age is not at all kryptonite against the things that we want either. Yes, age is an influence, but it's not going to determine your fate one way or the other. So there you go. Hope that gets you a little more motivated to hit the gym. No matter what age you're at, there's benefits to being strong and improving your health and wellness. And it doesn't take much to get started. You just have to have three basic movements, push, pull, and squat a couple times a week and a couple hard, good sets to get the ball rolling. It doesn't need to be a big, complicated thing. Oh, and one more thing I will say about there's a lot of stuff out there that's trying to target people at an advanced age, like how would you do strength training at an advanced age? You know, workouts for people over 40 and weight loss for people over 50 and stuff. The fact of the matter is the fundamental principles that are responsible for your results do not change with age, right? What makes you strong at 45 is the same stuff that's gonna make you strong at 25. Those principles do not change. So a lot of times these programs and stuff aren't really anything special. They're nothing new, they're just targeted marketing as it were, to say, oh, you need this type of workout because you're now older. It's like, yeah, push, pull, and squat. Eat plenty of whole foods. Drink plenty of water. Get plenty of rest. That's the same advice everybody needs. You don't need necessarily a wholly different advice just because you've passed some sort of certain number of times around the sun. And yeah, certain things do change when we get older. But again, as a coach, if I make something specific to you, it's specific to your abilities, not because you're 46. I never base my training on anybody's age. I don't care if you're 90 or 19. If you can do one-arm push-ups, I'm going to train you as someone who can do one-arm push-ups, not as someone who has a certain age. So just a little food for thought in addition there. All right, let's get to some questions here and get a swig of water. Thank you very much for coming on here, everybody. I know it's a later time. I had to move it around. My schedule got all kinds of crazy today. I originally had a very open schedule. Isn't that always the way? It's like, I got a totally open schedule. And then it just, boom, it got socked in and my everything got crazy. Anyway, Zarati Karate in the house. Always good to see you, my friend. Hey, Matt, <clears throat> I was wondering, whoop, let me pop it up here. I was wondering what exercises you recommend for me since I have a job that involves pulling and pushing several hundred pounds to 1,200 uh, to a, uh, 1200 of boxes with a pallet jack. Oh, very good. Well, my first iteration is if you've got some weight sled ability, that would be my first thing to go to because a pallet jack is kind of like just a giant weight sled. So if you've got access to a weight sled at a gym, um, I've known people to even just rig up like a, a car tire you put a strap or something around a car tire and you just pull or and you push that against the, the ground. Be mindful of your surface though. Uh, I used to do that in a local park and it just tore up the grass and I got hell for it. Uh, so anything that you're pushing and pulling with your whole body is really good. You can even do that isometrically, right? Sumo wrestlers for centuries have just pushed on trees and stuff. And that's actually, believe it or not, a very good isometric for having to push against things, which is why sumo wrestlers do it. They're pushing against people. Then you just wrap a strap or something around the tree and you try and pull on the tree. That's a good way to also to improve your neuromuscular synergy throughout your entire body. So your whole body is being used to move those pallet jacks around and loading things up as well. So excellent question. Very interesting 
good one there, Zarati Karate. Felix Yap coming on. Hey, Matt, if an old guy, in quotes, <laughs> after decades of trains reached the human plateau of push-ups, one arm with a perfect technique, congrats, what would be uh, going then? Where would you go from there? Uh, going to maintenance modes, any tips? This is actually a very good question because Again, like I said earlier, a lot of the programs and advice and things you hear about fitness on the internet are geared towards the beginner. Like things like you, you hear this all the time of like lift this weight and then once you get to a certain number of reps, then add weight and then get to a certain number of reps. This type of cycle of get stronger, add reps, get stronger, add reps, that usually happens reliably only for the first few years of someone's training career. And yes, we can make it happen any time. Of course, if you're a power lifter, you may ramp up for a competition. But the bulk of people's long-term training isn't going to follow a program where, or a, a progression model where you build up reps, then add weight, and build up reps and add or resistance and so forth. Most of your training isn't going to involve that on a regular basis. Instead, especially as you get older in your training career, a lot of your training is going to be about proficiency rather than just capacity of how much resistance you can lift and how much many reps you can do and so on. Instead, it's gonna be about improving how well you can do the actual thing. Like in the martial arts, like you can say, I'm gonna add 10 sidekicks to my program every day, but eventually you're gonna hit a point, you just can't do more. But there's always room to improve with proficiency. You can always do things better. So that one arm push up when you're saying I've got perfect technique, if you look for it, I guarantee you there are ways to improve that. There are things you can do to shift that around. So just spawn off the top of my head. One is are your feet together? Two, where are your shoulders going uh, with that? Are you losing any sort of motion from uh, the uh, top of the push up to the bottom? Uh, three, are you using your entire body for it? Are there some muscles that are not engaged? Four, how does your muscles in your push chain feel? Is it mostly in the chest, mostly in the triceps, mostly in the shoulder? Can you get the other muscles working a little bit more? Four, what are the differences between your right and left side? So when we're doing things unilaterally, you may feel one side is stronger than the other. Well, why is it different? Are you moving differently? Are you shifting differently? Is muscle engagement different? Look at those sorts of things. There's always something to work on. There's always something to be improving. I mean, my, me, myself, I'm now in year 33 of my martial arts training. I started Taekwondo when I was 10, 43 now, carry the one. Uh, yeah, that would be 33 years of training. I'm still learning how to do my sidekick better. I'm still learning how to do my front punch better, even though I learned those on day one when I was a 10-year-old little kid in sweatpants learning his first class of Taekwondo. So there's always ways to improve your proficiency. And then when you figure out things like, oh, I can do this a little bit better, a little bit more range of motion, then you can also go back of, okay, how do I build up doing more reps at this level of proficiency? How do I add more resistance, like having maybe a five pound plate in the other hand and so on. And there's always just many different avenues of progression you can explore. Very, very good question. Dave Rotman, how's it going, Dave? Thank you for coming on in. Hey, Matt, what are your thoughts on weighted calisthenics versus progressive calisthenics for building muscle? I'm curious if there are any legitimate advantages, one versus the other for building muscle. Outstanding question. So progressive calisthenics and weighted calisthenics are two of the four disciplines in grind style calisthenics method. The other two being suspension calisthenics and isometric training, of course. And yeah, everything's got its pros and its cons. That's why in grind style calisthenics, we have four disciplines. So they all kind of form this web of, to be a more complete holistic system. So generally we could look at it this way. With weighted calisthenics, you can add weight, and you, weighted calisthenics also mean taking weight off the body, like if you're doing pull-ups with bands or something, taking weight, so you're adjusting your body weight, in other words. So with weighted calisthenics, you're adjusting your weight, but you're not adjusting your technique. With progressive calisthenics, your body weight stays the same, but you're adjusting your technique, and oftentimes that means shifting how much weight is on a uh, limb. So the advantages with, with the weighted stuff is you don't have to adjust your technique. You don't have to improve your stability, your mobility. You don't have to improve your proficiency. You just have to make your muscle work harder. So that's the simplicity of it. That's why people oftentimes like it. However, remember, your capacity is always limited by your proficiency. If you don't improve your stability and your mobility and all these other things, eventually you're going to plateau pretty quickly. 
uh, uh, for a lot longer because you can only be as strong as you are stable. You can only be as stable as you can engage your muscles. So a lot of times when we just add weight, it's too easy. There's no like limit or there's no um, bouncer with the velvet rope saying, no, you can't work harder because you haven't earned the right to. With progressive calisthenics, that's in place. You have to improve your mobility. You have to improve your stability. You have to improve your muscle and tension control and all of these other softer qualities in order to handle more resistance. Now, at the end of the day, resistance is resistance or tension is tension. So your ability to build muscle should theoretically be the same across both of them. However, a lot of times people come into the progressive calisthenics world woefully lacking in their proficiency and how well they can use their muscles, which is why a lot of people don't get very far with it. It's not because progressive calisthenics isn't very good. It's because they try doing a pistol squat and fall right back on their butt. Or they do like, look at my sweet one arm push up, and it looks like they're twisting and contorting themselves as, as if they're getting an exorcism and possessed by demons. Lack of proficiency will always hold you back in that regard as well. So that's why you want to use probably both. You may err on one side versus the other due to personal preference, but with weighted calisthenics, it's easier to work harder, but you're missing out on proficiency. Progressive calisthenics is harder to work the muscle uh, sufficiently, but you're building up that proficiency which can open the gates for more potential progress. So it's kind of like half empty, half full, but if you practice both, you're just overflowing and getting the full cup either way. Very good. Let's see, we got the excellent uh, ones here coming on in. Thank you everybody for asking your questions. Remember, put a hey mat in the description so I know that you're asking a question of me and not just to the general RDP community here because we're all here to help each other grow stronger and get better workouts. Gerard645, hey Matt, do you have any tips for putting on substantial muscle using suspension straps? Love your videos, by the way, and you've helped me so much on my fitness journey. Outstanding. Thank you very much. Glad I can help you guys. Always appreciate when I get emails and stuff from people saying I've helped them. It makes me feel good because that's really why I do this sort of thing. But anyway, to your question, building muscle with suspension straps, no different than anything else. Suspension straps are just the tool that we're using. So the fundamental principle is still the same. We want to work our muscles hard and we want to work them to a very high degree of fatigue. Because uh, right now, that's what the research is mostly suggesting to is you make your muscles work uh, to that point where you're really struggling to complete your reps. And that's one of the main stimuli for building muscle. As the research now points, hell, next month, it could be very different for all we know. So you want to be using exercises like everything else that really works your muscle hard. Okay, and use a wide range of repetitions, right? Go heavy on some workouts or some sets, go very light. 10, 15, 20 repetitions, that's good. Push your muscles really hard. And your basic movement patterns are probably gonna be the lion's share for the bulk of what you're doing. Dips, push-ups, rows, pull-ups, squat and lunge variants, that sort of thing. Don't get too fancy. One of the things with suspension straps is I see a lot of people getting really kind of, really creative with it because they're very versatile tools. So you see people doing all sorts of things where like one arm is up and one arm is down and they're circling things around and they're moving in all sorts of dynamic, fun, circusy kind of ways. And that has its place. It's fun. It can bring you other benefits. But the bottom line, when it comes to building muscle, you want whatever kind of exercises are just going to be the easiest to work your muscles the hardest. And that's what the whole grind style calisthenics program is all based on. How do we make it real easy to work the muscles really hard? And full disclosure, that's going to be, quote, the boring exercises. They're nothing fancy. Push, pull, and squat. That's going to be your bread and butter for 80 to 90% of your routine. And you're going to either adjust your technique with progressive-based calisthenics or use weighted calisthenics to keep that weight or the resistance really high. But that's basically it. And always remember, too, that the exercises you do, the workout you do, plays a relatively small role in your overall potential to build muscle. It's like a, a match when you're trying to build a fire. Yes, you need that match. You need that spark. But ultimately, your ability for that match to build a fire or the exercise to stimulate and build muscle comes from lifestyle, plenty of sleep, plenty of good, whole quality foods, Treat yourself well. Don't deprive yourself. Don't beat yourself up. Make sure you're giving yourself plenty of recovery. That's the stuff that you have more 
of an influence towards your muscle building potential. As long as you're just making that muscle work pretty hard and pushing it to a high degree of fatigue, that's all you can do. You got that check mark uh, on the box and your workout is basically about as effective as it can be. All right, let's see what other questions we got on here. Dave back here. Hey Matt, what do you think about approaching unilateral work as a second side will be a little tired since you rotate from the first side? Absolutely. Do you just recommend switching which side you start with? Yeah, pretty much Dave. So what Dave is asking, like if you do archer pushups, for example, and you've got one side that's working harder than the other, and then you go over to the other side, well, my working arm is now more tired. So that may compromise my archer pushup on the other side a little bit. So yeah, exactly. Start with the other side. So start one set on the right side. And then the next time you do your archer pushups, either in the next workout or even the next set, you start on the other side and just keep switching back and forth. You can give yourself some degree of rest between uh, your sets, of course. So if you really are doing, uh, it's more about if both sides are working fairly evenly. Like if I'm doing archer pushups, but it's pretty close to 50-50, then give yourself more rest before you go to the other side. But if you're doing a unilateral exercise where most of the weight is on one side, you could probably just jump right to the other one because it's really not gonna be that fatigued. It wasn't working all that hard. But yeah, alternating back and forth, is probably the best way to go about it. Mike G, always good to see you, Mike. Thank you very much for coming on. Hey Matt. I get confused with muscle building requiring fatigue, but also progression. You can progress without fatigue and you can have high fatigue without progression. Outstanding thought process, my friend. So there's really two elements here. Yes, definitely. You're, you're very, very smart to be recognizing those two things. So you ultimately what you're doing is you're testing the work capacity of the muscle. Now, do you have to go to a super high level of fatigue or even quote unquote failure. That's why I always say fatigue because failure is somewhat subjective. Do you, can you still build muscle? Absolutely. Uh, really it boils down to, are your muscles working harder than last time in some capacity? And if they are, then that stimulus is going to be there to at least some degree. We're just talking about really hammering home that stimuli by pushing that fatigue point. And if you haven't seen it yet, check out my video that I did on Monday about combining micro workouts and grind style calisthenics. Uh, use a strategy in that that allows you to push your muscles to an obscenely high level of fatigue uh, very quickly and easily and also very safely as well. I won't tell you what it is. I want you to go watch the video. Of course, last Monday, it's grind style calisthenics and micro workouts combined to create more fatigue in the muscle. But yeah, you are absolutely correct. You can certainly get stronger and progress your ability to do the exercise, AKA the proficiency, and not necessarily build a whole lot of muscle. Happens all the time. It happens all the time, especially in calisthenics. Guys will be like, look at all this awesome, cool stuff I can do. And people are like, uh, still kind of skinny and scrawny there, buddy. And some people like that. Some people want that. They want to stay light and lean, obviously for some types of sports. So we want to recognize that that fatigue point is still there. But you're also right because you can always push yourself to fatigue and theoretically not build any muscle. Happens all the time. It happened for me for years because I would be like, okay, three sets of 10. And I'd always push it as hard as I could and never built anything. I'm like, I'm taking it to failure every single set. You know, I'm the, why am I not building muscle? It's like, because nothing's changing in your workouts. The work capacity of your muscle isn't actually increasing. It's still three sets of 10 with 135 on the bench press or whatever I was doing at the time. So we always wanna make sure we're paying attention to both. Are we getting stronger? Are we able to do something somehow better? We're trying to increase the work capacity of the muscle. And of course, that's not just one thing. That's not just how hard it can work. That's just not just how long it can work. It's a combination of the two. And we wanna make sure that we've, we're covering all our bases, not just one. Kind of like what I was saying earlier about you can have the best workout and still not build muscle if you're not covering the other bases of plenty of sleep, plenty of recovery, good diet, and so on. It's always a multifaceted approach. When we get too tunnel visioned into one thing, chances are that one thing, although is important, it's not nearly enough for us to accomplish our goal. Outstanding. God, you guys are putting on the professor caps for this one. This is fantastic. <laughs> Peter Rabbit, at age 42, if I quit lifting for too long, everything starts going south. That is a good thing to point out, 
Peter Rabbit, that I should have mentioned earlier that with age, there does seem to be a step off <laughs> faster if you just totally stop doing something. Like for me personally, if I, for whatever reason, don't do anything, three days, that's my max. I know that if I go more than 48 or 72 hours without any real like exercise or physical activity, I'm going to start losing some ground pretty quick in my abilities to do things. But thankfully, with like micro workouts and calisthenics and stuff, it's real easy to keep uh, that momentum going forward. I mean, hell, even when I was suffering COVID back in January, I'd get down on the floor and I'd do like eight push ups and I'm like, okay, there's my push workout, you know, but it was still something it still did something because it was still creating a stimulus there, even though <laughs> eight uh, push-ups was the max of my work capacity for the day. Very good, very good. Uh, here's one from Nick. Hey Matt, can you build muscle in a caloric deficit? And if so, is it harder? It is harder, quote unquote, um, but a couple of points that I iterated from my podcast two weeks ago. One, is technically there's no such thing as a caloric deficit because you can't burn calories that you don't already have on you. The reason why we lose weight is because we're always burning as many calories as we consume. It's just your source of the consumption is less from food and it's more from body fat. So yes, you absolutely can build muscle while in a deficit. This happens all the time for people who come to me initially and they're like, I'm totally out of shape, no strength training, I haven't done anything whatsoever, and I want to lose weight. I'm like, great, okay. So they start changing their diet a little bit, the pounds start coming off, but at the same time, they're like, my arms are bigger and my sleeves and my shoulders are broader. I'm like, yeah, you're building muscle. I'm like, how is that possible? Dude, you are a calorie surplus. When you've got an extra 30 pounds to lose, you are a calorie surplus. If your body has a caloric demand from the strength training, and says, gee, I wish we had some extra calories we could use to build this muscle. It's like, hello, we've got it. We've always had it. And this is why I always tell people that building muscle and losing body fat are not contradictory. In fact, they're complementary. If you've got a decent amount of body fat to lose, your body can very well tap into those reserves to make up for your caloric deficit in order to be able to support your training and your building muscle. Because ultimately, when we're trying to build muscle, what do we have? We have a caloric demand. It's no different than just doing a crap ton of cardio. When I was in college as a bike racer, I had a 5,000 calorie diet. And I wasn't building any muscle or any weight whatsoever because I needed that because my training created such a high caloric demand. It wasn't a surplus because I was using it. So the same exact thing happens. If your body is saying, I need to build muscle, that's a caloric demand. And if you have body fat to meet that caloric demand, you'll use the body fat. And sure, we've got other things that come into play as well too. When you're in a deficit, it is more stressful for the body. You've got hormonal changes going on. So it is harder, like I was saying, it definitely is harder, but it's certainly possible. It's not impossible. It happens all the time as a matter of fact. Sean's peak dude. Hey Matt, I'm a beginner to calisthenics. Welcome my friend. And I find training three times a week takes too long for my joints to recover safely. I also enjoy running. Uh, running Does running hinder my upper body recovery? Good question. And there's, there's a lot to unpack here, but one is if you need more time to recover, give yourself more time. Bottom line, like there's nothing magical about a given amount of rotations of the hands on the clock that your body goes by. Uh, your body doesn't know what time of day it is. It just knows, am I recovered enough? And this is one of the reasons why I went with more of a freestyle approach to training last year where I don't have any sort of a set workout routine. Like sometimes I'll work my legs twice a week. Sometimes it'll be once a week, depending on how much I've recovered and when they can go again. Because if I get start doing lunges, I'm like, oh, my legs are not feeling it today. I'm not feeling good. My knees are a little center. I was like, okay, try it tomorrow. Give it an extra day of recovery. Like you don't have to work out because it's a certain day on your calendar, right? So that's just the approach that I've taken. So if you need more time to recover, give yourself more time. This is part of the experience that I was talking about that comes with age. If you learn that you do better with more recovery, give yourself more recovery. And that's only going to be an advantage for helping your health, strength, and muscle building efforts. Uh, so running is something that can potentially elongate your recovery periods. 
because you're creating more stress on the body. You're creating more of a caloric demand. So if you're eating, you know, a good dinner and your muscles are like, dude, we could totally use this to recover. And, but at the same time, your muscles are, oh, hang on time out. No, we need this to recover from the running. So some of it's going to go to running. Some of it's going to go to recovery for the, uh, the strength training. It's like, eh, it's going to be a little bit less because you just have less resources. Now, of course, it depends on how hard you're training, your strength training, how long you're running. It's not like if you run up a flight of stairs, you're going to slow down your recovery. But the bottom line is there's a lot of influences to your recovery. Running is going to be one of them. And if you feel like it is slowing down your ability to recover in certain muscle groups, probably your legs, maybe not so much your upper body, then respect your body. Give it some more recovery if necessary, for sure. And you probably find that's going to change too. Uh, like as you get more used to certain exercises or you get more conditioned to things, your recovery period will shorten and sometimes it may elongate because you're stressed at work. And again, that's why I like a flexible approach because sometimes I need more recovery. Sometimes you don't need uh, quite as much. It's never quite a solid set thing. Charles Bloom. Hey, Matt, I've transitioned from strongman to obstacle course races. Awesome. Very good. Tough mutter. Uh, Spartan races, little known fact, I did the second ever Spartan race uh, ever. Uh, I think it was the second one up at the Catamount Family Center where I used to do my mountain bike races. Joe DeSena was there and everything up in Vermont it was a lot of fun. Anyway, I've begun using overcoming isometrics to train strength as opposed to weights like I'm used to. Are overcoming uh, isometrics enough? Well, enough for what is the first question, of course. Uh, but in many ways, you may find the overcoming isometrics to be superior to the weights, depending on what you're going after. Um, for one, it's going to drain your system a heck of a lot less than conventional strength training, therefore leaving a lot more of those resources I was just talking about for your obstacle course races. You're going to recover a lot faster from it. So if you've got like two or three races in a month period and you use overcoming isometrics, it's probably going to leave you in better shape for those races than if you were doing like high volume training with heavy squats and so on. Uh, can it build strength? Absolutely. In many ways, it'll build more strength. I'm a very big believer in isometrics being just good for training the muscles to turn on and work really, really hard because you will not be able to work your muscles to as high a degree of strength any other way. Just because you can go from zero to 100% full on maxed everything you've got and everywhere in between. And every other method is a lot harder to get to that point. Calisthenics, anything that's dynamic, anything where you're moving, is just going to be harder to work your muscles to that degree of strength due to the force velocity relationship. The harder they work, the slower they go. So in order to work them to the max, you can't move them. That's just that principle of neuromuscular physiology. So overcoming isometrics may very well be sufficient for what you're looking for, but don't take my word for it. Okay. Try it out, use it for a while, but after several weeks or a few months or so, and you notice you're losing a step here and there, or you're not quite getting exactly what you want out of it, then incorporate some of the other methods to fill that back in. But it doesn't have to be an all or nothing sort of thing. Lots of people will say, oh, I use like 80% of my training is overcoming isometrics. 20% is dynamic uh, stuff. Or the same thing with calisthenics. People think, oh, I got to be either weights or calisthenics. I'm like, no, use it however you like. 80% calisthenics, 20% weights. Or 20% or 80% weights, 20% calisthenics. Fitness is an open source platform, folks. Use it however you want. So if you want to ever make a change to it, go for it. Don't <laughs> You don't need permission from me to go in a certain direction if you feel like it, you're losing a step or you need to go, do things in a certain way. Chris, how's it going, Chris? Hey, Matt, The Rock said he's getting into the best shape of his life for the Black Adam superhero movie, which I'm looking forward to. At 48, the man's damn near 50. He's amazing. Should we uh, aspire for the same or is that unrealistic? Well, always take inspiration from your heroes, but also recommend that it is very much an apples to orange comparison. There are so many things in Dwayne Johnson's life and his history that have gotten to him to the point that he's at right now. And a lot of it's just going to be speculative too. Like, what do you think he's really doing? Is he on drugs or not? He very likely has an entire team of people working 
you know, he's got a chef, he's got therapists, he's got coaches. He's like, if he's got an ache in his shoulder, he's probably got like three or four physical therapists right on him saying, okay, we can figure this out so you can be back in shape and hundred percent by next week versus other people. They're going to have that nag nagging, aching shoulder, holding them back for like six months. So it is an apples to orange comparison, especially when you go to bigger differences. Like when I would compare myself to my good friend, back in the day racing bicycles, we were much closer together because we had very much the same point in life, lifestyle. We rode very much the same kind of bikes. So comparing me to him was a lot closer, but comparing like an average individual to Dwayne Johnson, there's so much different that it's, it's not even human at this point. It's like comparing a cheetah to an elephant at, at many degrees. So take inspiration from it and say, look at this guy, he's big and strong and he's almost 50, awesome, great. That gets me down on the floor doing my pushups, then it's good. But if you're comparing it, like how come I'm not big and strong like Dwayne Johnson is at 50 when I'm at 32, that's a detrimental comparison. That's not gonna do you any good. Awesome question. Like I said, you guys are really putting on your thinking caps and bringing your A games tonight. I sincerely appreciate it. Curly head, Chris, good question. Hey Matt, can you elaborate more on your muscle tension approach to flexibility? Well, the bottom line is, as a, a physical therapist friend of mine once said, is muscles are like dogs. She's like, when they're big and they're strong and they're tough, they just sit there and they go woof and you can't bother them and they're not bothered and they're strong. But when they're tiny and they're small and they're little security thing, they make a lot of noise, right? And it's the same thing with our muscles. When our muscles are weak and we have trouble engaging them, that sends a signal through our nervous system that our body is more frail and fragile and it needs protecting. And the body's last ditch resort at protection is to tighten up and make things stiff and tight because it know it can't handle very much, right? Don't, don't go out there, you know, don't get that arm fully overhead. It, can't handle it very well. So it's going to create a lot of tightness. But when things get stronger and we are like, no, 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 you, the muscle's fine. You know, see, we can use it. We can engage it. Now we can engage it more. It's like turning that little scared chihuahua into a big Doberman or a St. Bernard. And it's like, dude, throw anything at me. You want, you want to go hundred percent over in this direction? Oh yeah. No problem. I got this because I'm strong. I'm confident. That's why I talk about muscle confidence. It feels confident so that those safeguards your nervous system puts in place of saying, oh, don't go there. It's like, yeah, sure. Go that way. Yeah. Even more if you like, because we can handle it. And that's kind of a, a broader thing that we see in life. Insecurity breeds tightness. Insecurity and scared and nervousness, we get more confined in our beliefs, confined in our knowledge, confined in what we do in life, right? If someone's scared about spending money, they're going to pinch every penny and be like, no, I'm not going to go out and eat. No, I'm not going to, you know, splurge for the extra, you know, nice options on that car. And they, they live more confined. But if someone's not nervous about money, you know, and they're like, oh yeah, I've got plenty of bread to go around, another round for everybody, right? We loosen up that sort of thing. And that's one of the things I've noticed too in my own life. Back in the day, I had a lot of more self-esteem issues and I was always like this. And I went and visited some friends in Germany and I was like, I have to work out and I have to keep my diet tight. And I was always like this and always like this, always tight, 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 tight. And that was when I was 17. Well, when I was in my 20s, I went to Germany again to visit the same people with a couple other friends. And when I got back, my uh, host parents who uh, were taking care of me, they called up my dad and like, what happened to Matt? And they're like, what do you mean? He's like, he's fun to be around now. Like he's not like this all the time and brooding and stuff. He's funny. He's loosened up. And the reason why I've loosened up, I'm not nervous anymore. I'm not like scared of like, what if I say the wrong thing at the dinner table? And what if, what if I do this? And how, how, you know, always insecure. I'm like, yeah, sure. Whatever, you know, crack a joke and everybody laughs and stuff. It's just a big general philosophy that doesn't just apply to our muscles because it really is about our nervous system. And that goes to everything else in life. You got me talking on a wild tangent there, Chris. Great question. Fantastic. 
Another one from Zarate Karate. Hey, Matt, I was wondering if you're familiar with the muscle control exercises developed by Maxic. Absolutely. Maxic was a very early influence for this whole thing that I do. Um, I talk about Maxic in a lot of my earlier books and stuff and muscle control, mind muscle connection, tension control, that sort of thing. Him and a lot of other sources eventually got it through my thick skull that it's the mind that controls the muscles or more specifically the tension in the muscles. Think of tension control as like electricity going through wires. You know, you don't have to control your muscles. I promise you, they're gonna stay attached. Like my bicep is staying here no matter what I do. You don't have to control your muscle. You control the tension in the muscle. It's like electricity going right through those wires. You can think about a light bulb all day long. That's what I hear from people all the time. I think about the muscle, it doesn't do anything. Well, duh, <laughs> I can think about a light bulb all day long. It's not gonna turn on. You turn on a light bulb by sending electricity through a circuit. You engage your muscles by sending tension, which is actually real electricity through your nervous system. And the better you get at controlling that, the better you get at everything you want your muscles to do, including strength, including mobility, including speed, power, and so on. Very good. Let's see, what other we got going on here? More questions, thank you very much for coming on. JX, hey Matt, I do push-ups the right way and I have been doing it for a month and no benefits, what do I do? Well, a couple things. One, you're not doing them the right way. There is no right way, okay? That's the first thing we've got to get out of our mind. And again, that, that sort of the right way to do things is a sign of, to a degree of like the, that insecurity. Like I'm right, I'm doing things the right way. I've been doing push-ups very much for my exclusive, for my pushing for nearly 15 years now. And I feel like I'm just starting to kind of get the hang of them. I think I'm doing them okay at this point okay so after a month you're not even close there's so much to understand about push-ups that it's a very deep well and I, I don't mean that to say that like derogatory like i'm picking on you like you don't know what you're doing or anything it's just i want your mind to be open to the fact that you could learn about push-ups every single day for the next thousand years and still have more to learn about push-ups there's a lot to know about this exercise so that's the first thing to understand is there's a lot more to understand about these sort of things. Like where's your weight, um, where's your weight distribution on your hand? Okay. Now, how does your weight distribution change throughout each rep? How does your weight distribution change throughout the set? How does your weight distribution change throughout your workout? How's the weight distribution between your right and your left hand different? How is it different between the reps? How's it different throughout the set and throughout the workout? What finger has more weight on it? Are you digging in with any of your fingers? Are you moving your hand at various angles during the set? Which angle is right for you, 11 degrees or 12 degrees? That's the sort of detail that we can eventually get into just to give you some examples. So that's the first thing. Second thing, a month. I know a month seems like a while. And that's the thing is when you're getting started, the first periods of time seem like a long time. When I was 10 years old, doing martial arts, I remember I found this piece of foam from a construction site. And I was like, I'm gonna kick this with a sidekick. I've been doing Taekwondo for six whole months. I'm strong enough to kick that. No, I could not break that piece of foam insulation with a sidekick. And I was like, I've been doing this for six months. What the hell is wrong with me? What's wrong with you know, stuff? Of course, now after 33 years, I'm like, dude, six months is nothing. Like you're not even getting started with learning a decent sidekick at six months. That's kind of the attitude that you'll eventually have if you stick with your pushups. I know a month seems like a long time, but you're barely scratching the surface. You're gonna be barely scratching the surface after five years if you're really digging deep into this whole pushup thing. So you got a long way to go, but last point is I guarantee you something is happening. There are benefits, you're just not quite aware of them. There's something called the plateau of latent potential, which basically means that change happens, but you don't notice it until you reach a tipping point. And then it seems like overnight, whoa, hey, I'm changing around. So change is happening, it is beneficial. You are getting something from it, I promise you that. It is impossible to do any sort of training and not get some sort of a stimulus generated from it. It's impossible to put any kind of effort into any kind of physical activity and not create a stimulus for change. So I guarantee you it's doing something and it's probably gonna add up to more than you think if you keep learning more about pushups and you keep giving it a little bit more time. Very good question. Thank you so much for coming on. Very, very uh, much appreciative 
uh, with that one. Oops, sorry, Chris, didn't mean to go on there. Let's see what other questions we have here, wrapping things on up. Hopefully, we got a handstand question here. Gorbo, hey Matt, are freestanding handstands the single most effective way to build upper body strength? Balancing your entire body weight on your arms and shoulders must really force your mind and muscles to adapt. Absolutely. They're a lot harder than people give them credit for. I mean, I know you, there are guys out there like on YouTube and stuff who can do it. And people are like, oh, yeah, that's pretty impressive and stuff. And that's 1% territory. That's like 1% of 1% territory. Most people can't stand on their hands, let alone do push-ups on it freestanding. So being able to accomplish that feat does require an insane amount of strength, an insane amount of control, and all the things that go with it. Single best for building up the body? It's certainly going to be up there, but I don't want to put it too much on a pedestal of like, that's the one thing you should be working for because regular push-up progressions, pull-ups, rows. I mean, I know some people out there who have amazing strength and physiques and they couldn't do a handstand push-up to save their life. So it certainly is very effective and very good, but it's by no means like the king of them all and the one that you should always strive for because if someday, heaven forbid, you got a shoulder impingement issue or something like, can't do handstands anymore. Like, okay, no more handstands. We got plenty of other ways to build up your strength and muscle. Don't worry about it kind of thing. You wouldn't be terribly missing out if you weren't able to, to do it as well. All right. <laughs> oh, this is a question. Oh, damn, I lost it. Shoot, on the, on the scroll here. I always wanted to, uh, to elaborate on this. Oh, damn. Oh, shoot, I lost it. Oh, yeah, here we go. Mike McGuel, why are why all strong men are bald? Well, it's genetic. Not everyone's blessed with a perfect head. And, you know, God only made so many perfect heads, the rest he had to cover with hair. But no, it is a curious thing, right? At one point when I was working at the Colorado Athletic Club, I think really like half of us, we had about 30 trainers on staff and about half to maybe maybe a, a little more over a third of us were bald as a cue ball. People were like, does anybody here have hair? And it really is a curious thing. And my personal theory about it is that dedicated strength training may do a little something to the hormones of the body to shift it around. Uh, me personally, I did the, the math, you know, in my years, people are like, well, you start noticing your hair loss, about 50% loss. Okay. Where was that? And it takes about that amount of time. So I figure I started losing my hair roughly about the time I started doing serious strength training. I don't know if it triggered a little bit of something and I, that's pure speculation, bro science. I have no idea if there's any validity to that whatsoever, but you know, it's like they say, it's the old joke in powerlifting. If you shave your head, you get 10% stronger. If you grow a beard, you get 10% stronger. And if you do both, you get 25% stronger. That's backed by science, of course. So it is a curious thing. Who knows? Who knows? It, it, this, this sort of thing is, um, one of life's lessons that I, I really take to heart. Uh, one is it was a lesson of saying that you're not really in control of your body as much as you think you are. Like that's the whole thing about fitness. The whole premise behind fitness and exercise is you can have absolute control of your body. You can control every ounce of fat. You can control your muscle and you can live as long as you want and stay healthy and stuff. And the fact of the matter is no, you don't ever have full control. There are always going to be influences to your health and fitness that you have no say over. And I know that that doesn't sit well with people because the premise behind all of our programs and diets is that we can have full control. But no, no, if, if you're gonna lose your hair, you're gonna lose your hair. <laughs> it's just the way it's going to work. Drugs are getting better for that sort of thing as well. But uh, this was mother nature's way of saying, yeah, you think you can be in control, but I'm gonna show you otherwise. And uh, I take that to heart. JX, hey Matt, I do push-ups every day and get no, whoop, sorry, that was the same question. Sorry about that, Jay, my my bad. I'm going back into the, the other questions here. Sorry, folks. Well, I'll start to, to wrap things on up here. I'm sure everybody's starting to go through. Let me make sure I just didn't miss anything. Let's see. A lot of conversation back and forth. I love you guys talking to each other. This is great. We got such a great community here. Everybody's so supportive of each other and stuff. So 
I'm going to let you folks all go for the night. But thank you so much for watching and listening. If you're listening to the audio on podcast, because remember, I post the audio of this a couple days after I do the live stream. So if uh, you ever miss one of these and you're like, oh, I want to catch up, they're all on the Red Delta Project podcast audio streams through your podcast directory as well. So have a good night, everybody. Thanks so much for your questions. I'll talk to you next week. Till then, be fit and live free.